It's good to be here with all of you this morning. Um, and fun to be talking about uh, the intersection of a number of topics that I think are unavoidable. Um, so my very simple equation um, that will guide the next few minutes is water um, when paired with the known risks that we face through climate change yield a series of risks for the energy sector. And what I want to do, I think that's probably an intuitive thesis. So uh, it's Duke, so you guys probably have figured out that much on your own. Um, what I want to do is provide a little bit of a framework for how to think about that. Um, and maybe use that as something that guides aspects of your work, uh, either today or in the future. So framework, want to sort of break it down into three uh, pillars. The first place I think um, that we really see significant risk, and I really come at this from a multidisciplinary background, had spent a decade in government, um, now advise public companies and private equity, and uh, teach as well. So I, I, I think about this in a multidisciplinary way. And I think that's sort of how you have to come at this issue, um, because you do have to leverage so much of what's going on in different pockets, whether it's in academia or in finance, and, and take away some insight. So the first real place um, that I think the risks are gripping are in the physical sense. Um, and we'll, we'll drill into this a little bit more but I'm thinking about floods uh, and energy assets that are located in floodplains. Um, I'm thinking about increased and changing patterns of precipitation. So before, maybe you didn't expect heavy rainfall disrupting um, your physical assets. Maybe now you have to deal with that. You have to think about it. Um, and maybe it's not for a generation. Maybe the impact is on transmission and distribution. But there's a significant uh, risk that's presented there. And then all of that obviously gets intensified in the context of storms, um, hurricanes uh, most familiar, especially here on the east coast of the United States. But physical risks growingly, I think, material for people operating in the energy sector, whether you're on the power side um, or on the fuel side. The second is also physical in a sense, but this goes to the core of the operations. And this is where um, so many people have, I think, done work for a, probably a longer period of time. This is probably the better understood dimension. Um, and that is the direct operational impacts related to water, um, either scarcity or, or too much water. The most obvious manifestation of that uh, is in hydropower. Um, but we see it in other dimensions as well. Um, and want to want to talk a little bit uh, about that. And finally, um, and this is perhaps uh, most nascent, uh, at least in the United States, not something we probably spend a bunch of time thinking about. Um, but if you, you know, walk around the Middle East, uh, and in particular spend time in Israel where desal is a big component of their water supply, um, the energy consumption from water is something people think about. So you can think about that as a, as a downside risk, but you can also think about it as an upside risk, especially for folks who are concerned about uh, flat or declining loads in the power sector. So first, want to just go through um, some of the, I think, elements of the physical risk. Um, perhaps most poignantly, the first time I really thought about this was sitting in the office of uh, the Secretary of Energy at the time, right around the time Fukushima took place. And thinking about the impact of um, this catastrophic water-related event, um, paired with not just disruption to um, the plants, but to the generation uh, and the backup power generation related to the plants. So 
what's interesting, especially with nuclear, is that it tends to be sited near water um, because of its cooling needs. So that's a, that's a place where you have significant risk exposure. Another place, and in, in North Carolina is familiar with this, uh, where you see that risk exposure is in coal. Um, coal, ash in particular, and the environmental issues that, that flow from that are dramatically punctuated during water-related events. So as we see increasing issues related there, um, you've, got, you've got challenges. Hydropower, dam safety, um, significant challenge. And then in the oil and gas uh, arena, we see this where bond ratings have actually gone down for operators off the shore of the Gulf of Mexico. So you're, you're literally seeing not only this as a potential risk, but one that is both material and leading to increased lending costs for people who are uh, operating in places that are increasingly poor, uh, uh, increasingly um, uh, vulnerable to water-related risks. So then let's shift to, to operational. Um, and this is a particularly, I think, poignant picture from um, what should be a water generating or a electricity generating resource in India um, and clearly is not doing that. But, you know, we saw this in the United States with uh, Shasta Dam and, and uh, California's uh, hydropower generating capacity and the West's hydropower generating capacity during the significant droughts um, that we saw over the last decade where th with production dropping uh, almost to a half um, of what we had seen in, in certain instances. In other places, the production levels decline even more significantly. And if you care about emissions, the question is, what backfills that during those periods of drought? Um, so are you going to be running more coal and natural gas uh, in moments of drought? How do you think about that? So pretty significant operational risk there. Um, another place where the operational risk pops up is in the biofuel supply chain. Um, again, we've seen this with soybean prices, um, with uh, sugarcane-based ethanols. Um, so another place where there is a significant interaction between drought and sort of scarcity-related water issues and the productivity of, of energy supply. And then the last place that I'll sort of point out that, that perhaps is um, least obvious is, is in the oil and gas production space, where um, especially hydraulic fracturing requires immense amounts of water. Um, and while we have made improvements in terms of uh, tightening up that cycle and, and, and recycling uh, that liquid back, in, in moments of severe water stress, you can see that put a lot of downward pressure on the economics of oil and gas. So, we go, I've sort of done the, the tale of woe uh, on water, and then there's a question of, well, if you're in the power business uh, or in the energy business, is there an opportunity for you as well? Um, and I think there is. So for the longest time in energy, um, the federal government and others involved in spurring research and development and innovation have thought about our energy challenges in a multi-pronged way. We think about energy efficiency, reducing the energy we consume, and then we think about new supply. Uh, we think about how do we get supply from renewable sources because we're trying to deal with uh, an externality associated with fossil fuel consumption. In the water arena, that's not actually been uh, the, the thesis. We've, we've done a lot in terms of efficiency, and there are a lot of folks here at Duke in particular who've invested time in that. But we've lagged, especially as a country, in diversifying our sources of supply. And desal provides that opportunity. Um, but if you do it, uh, chances are you're going to put a significant amount of load, especially on the coastlines where you're already fairly tight, or in an ERCOT type place where you're already fairly tight um, and uh, increased demand. One analysis suggests that if the United States were to shift to uh, desal-based drinking water, 
So you, you know, allocate all the, the rest of the clean water uh, to other, uh, to other um, aspects of your economy, you could increase power demand by 10%, which is a lot. So we're not doing, we're obviously not going all the way there, but it just shows you how much the needle can move with incremental uh, increase in supply that's produced in a much more uh, energy intensive way. In addition to desal, um, in the development context, another place to think about where power demand goes up as a result of um, water consumption or water consumption being uh, taken care of in a different way is irrigation. Um, and we've seen the World Bank make a real push to put to replace diesel-based generation uh, irrigation with um, with solar-based irrigation. But that's a significant uh, potential driver as well. So a, a, an interesting nexus point. Um, you know, there, research and development has a huge role to play, and, and um, the the Department of Energy is actually doing really amazing work in driving down the cost of desal technology. So we're actually we're actually now on a pathway to parity um, between what comes out of the pipe and what desal could produce. A lot of ways to go, but there's a, at least now a research roadmap and a significant amount of resources being spent against that. So less of a less of a hypothetical and more more of a practical concern. So just want to close out with where where one might be managing this risk. The first is just through breakthrough research, exactly the stuff we're talking about on desal, but also investing in things like hardening and resilience of the grid and of our systems, thinking about supply chain management through uh, integration of AI and better sensor technology so we are reducing downtime on the system. The second place is really an expansion of impact investment, the nexus of water and energy uh, that advances greenhouse gas reduction and helps ameliorate water stress is a great place for impact investment. We're seeing more of that, um, especially in the sort of early stage through patient and philanthropic capital coming in uh, and looking for these opportunities. And then finally, and this is where the sort of, I think, bigger uh, mobilization is happening right now, is on the diligence and disclosure side. And there's been a lot of change. I've personally worked on a bunch of large M&A deals where clients are looking for due diligence that includes water resilience risk analysis. They'll look at uh, the real property footprint. They'll look at the operational footprint. And then on the public company side, that's becoming a growing concern in terms of do you disclose it? How do you disclose it? How much do you disclose? Uh, what's material for investors? Um, and spending a lot of time counseling public com company clients on that. So um, lots of touch points, whether you're early stage, you're thinking about going into government or there, um, whether you're an impact investor and you're interested in the early stages, uh, a lot of opportunity there. And frankly, if you're way down um, uh, in either the public or private markets, moving uh, large amounts of capital, this is something more and more people are paying attention to, certainly spending a lot of time with our clients on that. So just want to close out with a uh, final thought. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is the blue marble we all know. Um, and it's just, for me, still staggering, uh, despite having probably delivered some version of this line a, a thousand or more times and probably heard it 10,000 times, that 97.5% of the blue is, is salt water. Um, that the remaining two and a half is fresh, but two thirds of that is frozen. Although we are spending a lot of time trying to unfreeze that, and that's that's probably not good. But um, uh, um, you know, just just staggering that uh, water is such a um, binding constraint potentially on our development goals, on our climate goals on the livability of our communities, on uh, so many aspects of our quality of life, and, and one place where that intersects is on energy. So grateful for the opportunity to, I think, have a more complete conversation on energy by including water, uh, risk, physical, operational, 
um, and the opportunity it presents for people who want to sell more power. So thank you.